Hi, it's Anthea again. Feeling a bit tired, but I've been singing all morning. And it's been the song that kind of creeped me out a bit when I was listening to it. Um, but I can't remember all the lyrics. And I only kind of remember the snippets of lyrics that are meaningful to me. Um, so yesterday I was talking about how the song Rainbow Connection, when I listen, I listened to Kermit the Frog. And I looked up the year it was put out, and it's 1979, which is when I was a young, young child. And so it's quite interesting because movie themes, songs and things seem to match up with dates. Um, that are kind of connected for me with trauma. And I found that the Sarah McLaughlin version, because I was feeling really, really tired um, in the evening, especially after taking my meds, I kind of freaked out a little bit and I think it was because she sang it in kind of a hypnotic kind of way and I had quite a lot of horrible memories surface and that's kind of like my fear because I've had it happen when my, my mood has been elevated or mixed with my bipolar um, and also the depression it depends it just it seems to be with the mood episodes that just um the tra traumatic memories are just go woof and I do have some medications if necessary to um, knock myself out if I have because um, I've been told my PTSD and my bipolar I have bipolar one disorder um, they exasperate each other I don't know if that's the correct word but I make up words sometimes um, so anyway um, I um, after talking to you, I I had been, to ease my anxiety, I um, listened to the song Sowing the Seeds of Love, and then I um, talked to you, and then I had this song um, by Robbie Williams, Let Me Entertain You on My Mind. I listened to that, and that just went, woof, with my mood. I went elevated. So I actually, even though I saw social anxiety and I think, oh my gosh, should I post this? You know, later in the day I posted it and it was just me having a dance. But I posted it because I'm just showing you um, what it can look like. So that's kind of like um, the hypomania. I'm still aware, I can still see the ground. Uh, whereas full mania, I have done this, it's like dance in my underwear. <laughs> yeah, and um, and then after that, um, I listened to the song Rocket Man by Elton John. And like I said, I have trouble with my memory, with my disorders, and um, I forget what the lyrics are. And even how the tune goes, but the Rainbow Connection today, I've been remembering how the tune goes and some of the lyrics, and um, and then I just made up my own lyrics. <laughs> um, but the Rocket Man said something about being up in outer space and it's lonely out there, burning up a fuse. Mm. So yeah, it's pretty much it. So I believe. Um, from my observation of myself, I don't know if it's the same for other people, there I go high, my brain goes high as an escape from the pain, like it's flying away. And uh, if it's extremely triggering, I get launched off into outer space. And that's why my meds to try and keep me like a, more like a kite with a, I've got a prescription written here, like an anchored flying, like a kite taking flight. Even though I'd rather be a bird flying and going where I please, I'm kind of more like this. Um, so I can take flight, but I need to be able to land safely without. But sometimes it crashes a little bit rough, but it's not as dangerous or bad as it was when I was fully manic. Um, so, and the other agenda to this with my form of PTSD from childhood is the. Um, shut down variety and because it's very quiet generally 
um, it wasn't picked up until my 40s, until after I was diagnosed with um, bipolar, also in my 40s. Um, so, um, yeah, so I would just, just freeze, dissociate, no one would notice. And I actually had memories of doing this as a child, and then it became like my coping mechanism. And then um, there's signs of um, hypomania I can remember from around puberty, probably from, I had some memories of about 10 years old and 11 years old. Um, and I actually asked a friend who knew me at that time, and she said I did speak fast under um, stress, which can also be my anxiety, so I have social anxiety, especially if I was doing a speech at the front of the class. And then when I was in primary school, I wouldn't do a speech at the front of the class. I wouldn't even speak to anyone. Um, so I didn't speak to the teachers. I did all my work, but I just didn't speak. So I was like mute. I only spoke, spoke to my parents at home and didn't speak to anyone else. And then I only spoke to a friend. I tended to have one friend at a time and we'd go and play marbles and do things like that. And um, so... Um, I'm not showing you my videos at full extreme. Uh, I am on meds. Um, I am, you will, if you compare videos, see um, the mood shifts. Uh, so yeah, yesterday I was like hypermanic pretty extremely and almost bordering into manic. And the interesting thing was is that, because uh, I see the pattern so extremely, I was listening to Rocket Man which was a little bit more slow paced, well, a lot more slow paced than um, Let Me Entertain You. And um, yeah, I saw a vehicle that said rocket ship. So yeah, I, my mind just notices things that happen to be related. And it, it can kind of seem futuristic. So it's like I wasn't aware of the Jojo Rabbit poster consciously took all those pictures of the rabbits that I saw everywhere or who noticed everywhere about rabbits after seeing rabbits with my friend Joe, and then I and then when I walked past the cinema I saw the poster Jojo Rabbit. Now perhaps I'd seen an ad for it or heard it somewhere. I don't know. Um, there's a word I was told by someone it's the opposite of deja vu deja vu. Um can't remember it now. I wrote it down. <laughs> can't remember. So I have um quite extreme memory issues. I I forget where I park the car, that's why sometimes I'll take a photo on my phone, um, I shop nearby, um, and I remember in Australia I did a merchandising job and I had to go to a multi-car park building, I forget which level I parked on, oh, it was such a pain if we got up and down all over the place, and to manage my pet sitting business that I had, um, I just had to use tools to help me remember, so um, have my clients email me. Uh, use a pet sitting software um, that I could schedule in visits with all the pet data and all their feeding information and all their clients' names. I remember the pets' names but not the clients' names, which was a bit embarrassing if I saw a client in a shop and I couldn't remember who they were because I'd only met them once um, and then, you know, I knew their pets and everything but I couldn't remember who they were. Um, even though I dealt with them, you know, quite often. Uh, because I'd only seen their face once, I couldn't remember it. So, um, yeah, that was a bit, a bit embarrassing. Um, but that's how, yeah, I actually won an award because uh, I was so passionate about my business until I got really burnt out. But I sold it for a pittance um, to someone else. Um, but just before I, not long after, I ended up in hospital. But anyway, I, yeah, I won a business award. Um, in the city um, and also got a finalist in another a business award for that business and I got a letter from the mayor <laughs> um, and yeah it was voted on the client feedback plus um, the street shopper and she said I was just really really passionate about it um, so yeah I felt really really disappointed I couldn't continue um, um, but that's been, that's been kind of like my life, it's been fly in the air, crash, fly in the air, crash, fly in the air, crash. Had lots of different jobs, uh, well actually, despite being scared of standing in front of people and talking. I managed to be a science teacher for a year, and I was like massively burnt out, but I felt really distinct, like a failure. 
but then I found out that about a quarter of new teachers quit within the first couple of years anyway. So I was also disillusioned with the system, um, very rigid educational systems. Uh, they they failed the children and kept them being failures um, in their eyes, and I didn't like that. And yeah, I, I came up with all these creative ways to help children pass. And I do remember one student. Um, I did read their tests out for them first, and then helped them to learn to spell the words and things, and um, learn to read a scale on a ruler or a thermometer. All basic stuff that they hadn't learned yet. But I, I put lots of effort into this class, and um, one day um, the bo a boy in the class passed the test, and he ran around the room like a dog doing zoomies. <laughs> the same excitement you've ever seen a dog do zoomies, that kind of, this child is doing zoomies. I passed my first test ever! He was so excited. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I do have some... Some fond memories. That class drove me up the wall at first, but I helped them. And then at the end of the year, I gave them a test which I couldn't read out to them. They had to do it on their own. And another class um, in the school had split them into what they thought their abilities were. Gave them an identical test. They got similar marks. And in that class, was, the, the school had done a test at the beginning of the year decided that they were the, the lowest ranking class and they scaled it back down to what, what they got what they came in on the, on the first day of the year which they could have had a, ba a bad day you know and um, I said to them well, why did they scale them down because they said oh you must have set the test too easy I said I gave them exactly the same test as the other class and they've got they've got the same marks. I just worked really hard to try and get that class up, and you have gone and failed them all, you know, down to thirty percent when they got fifty five percent kind of thing. You know, it was a class that really struggled, and I just had to find all these creative ways just to help motivate them. And um, no, that was their policy. So I thought I'll stick your stinking policy, you know. And um, and then there was one girl in the class still, I think she might have had dyslexia because after all the work I did with helping them spell the words and everything they needed for their topics, um, she still had difficulty and she was really, really discouraged. So I went to the reading teacher. I said, can you help this girl? I think she's, she might have dyslexia. She said, oh, which class she's in? I told them, oh, that's the bottom class. Can't fix a cracked pot. What? And I was told that I couldn't do anything about it. I complained to the principal about it. No, can't do anything. And one of the deputy principals, principals was a boy, like to staff and students. Like she bullied. Yeah, I, I ended up being one of your targets. Because uh, it's different. I had to do a lot of masking to, to do that job. Because I have social anxiety. And I didn't realise I had PTSD and bipolar. I was actually hypermanic to cope with that job. But then of course when I come back down again, uh, I was just burnt out majorly, I was having panic attacks and I couldn't remember anything anymore and yeah. So yeah, I had lots of different jobs. I used to also be a music teacher. So I did that um, when my son was little, probably for about four or five years I think. And then I burnt out with that as well. And then I ended up, um, I used to teach piano and keyboard privately. Even though I had difficulty reading music, I was, um, I still did grade, grade 6 classical and then I was um, doing the modern um, and the modern is a bit easier kind of thing, like we use the music as a guide and then use the chords and then um, teach them how to make their own um, tunes based on patterns and of course patterns is my thing. So um, I do remember when I was like undiagnosed bipolar in my early 20s after a breakdown and I went, um, my parents sent me to an, an art camp because they knew that art was always something that I loved even though I didn't do it most of the time 
I couldn't. Um, I, was, I was really struggling, but I quite enjoyed myself and then there was a, a piano there. I just played it. And then um, just making up patterns. But the, the playing was like being able to express an emotion that I shut down. And the patterns were kind of just, just whatever came out, kind of based loosely on chords and arpeggios, but just pretty much the same pattern, but then something different comes out all the time. And I can't remember what I played because it's just different each time. And I was aware that someone was sitting beside me, or behind me. So I looked, and there was one of the artists who was doing my workshops. And he was sitting there kind of in a daze. He said, I've never heard such beautiful music before. The thing is that most people actually haven't heard me play. Um, because it's kind of, I feel anxious about playing for other people. And um, I taught, when I did the teaching, I taught students and adults. And then I just gave it up all of a sudden. And it was actually after I did a, a music exam. And they wanted me to do a music exam. But the, all the practicing for it, perfecting it and everything, made me feel like the perfectionist and made me feel unhappy. And I'd learned techniques to help manage my anxiety. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to speak to you at all on the camera. And so I still get anxious, but I, I can manage it more even though I hide in my room still most of the time. So, um, anyway, I got distinction. Usually I'd, in my previous exams years ago at school, I would get merit since in the high 70s uh, because I would, my mind would just go blank and I would just go on the repetition, finger memory, and I'd make little mistakes because I was just in this whirlwind of panic, basically. <laughs> It's like having a panic attack, the anxiety, like the deer in the headlights kind of thing. But I did this exam and I did some breathing exercise just before, just to calm myself. And I still felt that, but not as extreme. It did it. It gave me distinction. I can't remember the exact mark. It was either 97 or 98 percent. The music teacher said, that's absolutely wonderful. I said, no, I feel depressed. She goes, why do you feel depressed? I see because I feel like that perfectionism again it just made me so unhappy in my childhood having to feel like I had to do everything perfectly I actually feel happier if I just make things up and if they're kind of messy like this painting here is done on a bit of old cardboard with some old garage paints it's got some dings in the corner still from the cardboard how it came out how the piece of cardboard lying around in the garage I actually felt better more of a release doing that kind of thing you know so that's why I had a painter for a very, very long time, but the last couple of years I've been doing painting and it's, to me, it's messy. But um, it's, I feel happier doing something messy than trying to do it perfect. Um, so, um, I'll cut that short and I'll, because um, I probably remember it all long enough. Thanks.